of my series on trigonometric MHCs. And so uh, I gave this kind of survey in the first talk and this so more uh, lecture style talk uh, yesterday in the second talk. And so today I'll try to give you, give you an update on some uh, recent work uh, from the last two years, let's say, uh, on this topic. And so the idea is that I want to outline a universal approach for constructing trigonometric K matrices. And uh, the detail, kind of the key ingredient that I haven't really explained yet in the previous two talks is the use of formal Laurent series, an idea which originally goes back to Drinfeld in the, for the universal R matrix. So the plan for today is that I will first give you, uh, kind of, a, let's say, a, a sketch of the universal approach, let's say, a naive, uh, my naive interpretation of it that I kind of developed before we were actually uh, able to solve this problem. Uh, and this kind of naive, uh, simplified, let's say, uh, uh, viewpoint actually already shows you that there's something, uh, there's something going on that, that basically means that you can't do the, the straightforward thing if you know about universal R matrices. For universal K matrices, you need to modify things a bit, bit more than you might expect. Uh, quite apart from this uh, um, use of formal Laurent series, this is a general uh, a general thing. And then uh, in two part two, I will uh, talk about uh, or kind of remind you of Drinfeld's construction of the trigonometric R matrix through the universal R matrix. And then in part three, I will highlight the kind of the main results from the recent work. And so the recent work is really two papers. Uh, one is from a few years ago, which has recently been published, but I will refer to it as AV20, because it was, it was it appeared on archive in 2020. And then a few months ago, well, I guess half a year ago, we have a more recent paper uh, that will be the main topic of the talk, which is actually how to get these trigonometric game matrices from a universal formalism. Uh, I already outlined why, uh, for in integrability, let's, let's say we want to, we're interested in creating solutions to certain braid type equations that depend on parameters. And so I just want to emphasize or reiterate the, the setting that, that we're in. So what, what, what we want to have in order to do nice things in integrability. So we want a class of complex finite dimensional vector spaces, which is closed on the tensor products. And we want for each choice of vector spaces from our class uh, operators that satisfy these braid, these, these braid relations that are specified here. And so this is a fairly general formalism where the R matrix depends on two parameters in, in practice for quantum affine algebra. So we'll look at R matrices which depend on quotients of, of, of the parameters. Uh, and so there will be various uh, kind of things that are kind of specific to quantum affine algebra, which, which, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll run into. But the, the most general picture is this, I guess, up to this uh, generalization to Chiretnik's reflection equation, which we'll come to in a second. But this is basically, let's say, the, the basic example I want to, want to solve. Okay, so here are the, the pictures for the, for the reflection equation again. It's just uh, the way I've drawn it in terms of this uh, strands near a vertical puncture, how they can interact with this puncture, uh, turning it into pictures, sorry, turning the, this, this picture into formulas using this uh, identification on the left bottom, then you get uh, this reflection equation, which appears in the work by Chiretnik and then uh, Sklanin and many others from the 80s onwards. <coughs> okay, and so let's just first look at uh, the Young Baxter equation. What kind of how I can summarize the existing uh, universal formalism in, in a very kind of uh, na naive way. So this is how I started with trying to do it for the reflection equation. I just tried to simplify the, the Young Baxter equation uh, approach as much as possible until I could kind of pinpoint uh, an obstacle. And so, uh, but first of all, for the young Baxter equation, I can simply say, suppose I have an algebra, which will be the quantum group, but let's just call it an algebra A. And suppose I, in the tensor product of A with itself, I have an element that satisfies this universal young Baxter equation. And there's a very straightforward thing you can check. If I have parameter dependent representations into my class C, depending on some complex number, let's say, then I can simply define this, uh, as my R matrix in the representation, and immediately the Young Baxter equation follows the spectral Young Baxter equation that we're interested in with parameter dependence. And so this universal Young Baxter equation holds, uh, for instance, and this is the traditional uh, setting in quasi triangular bialgebras. And so quantum groups give you examples of this. And so the question is, and when, when do you get these nice 
parameter dependent representations and then for that you need affine quantum groups and so roughly speaking this is how trigonometric armatures arise up to this issue with these formal Laurent series which we'll come to later but anyway this is a good kind of starting point so in the late 80s this was uh, formulated uh, roughly in this way okay and so we can try something similar for the for the reflection equation and so let's have this setting of course we have an algebra the special element r and the tensor product of the algebra with itself and this class of representations okay and now i'm making a little assumption i want to make sure that i have parameter dependent representations but I'm, i have to say that this parameter cannot be zero because i want to invert be able to invert it but that's actually the least of our problems here this is just a little kind of technicality suppose i write down this universal reflection equation which is very similar to the young baxter equation i just put an extra k in and it looks very similar to uh, to the pictures i've drawn on the first slide and and this parameter dependent version it's probably the first the first thing you you would you would try and so i could say well if i have such a solution k in the algebra i can simply apply the representation map and define a matrix in my in my acting on my representation v now this does not be, oh, actually uh, satisfy the desired spectral reflection equation so by the you see red parameters, they should appear inverted if I want to get Tiretnik's and Sklanin's reflection equation, but they don't. They appear without the inversion. And that's simply because of the nature of this of this reflection equation. If I simply apply uh, apply this representation map on this reflection equation, I get this incorrect, let's say, uh, parameter dependent equation. And so uh, that that's kind of a crucial difference with. Uh, with the setting for the Young-Baxter equation, there's an extra subtlety here which needs to be taken care of. So it's still useful to look at this kind of uh, version one of the universal reflection equation because it has been used for quantum groups of finite type to deduce solutions of the constant reflection equation. Again, once you have this reflection equation in the algebra, this first universal one, applying representation maps, you immediately get such a reflection equation. That's not the tricky thing. The tricky thing is. To actually construct solutions k that satisfy this equation in the algebra and so the first construction uh, was done in the early 90s in a very special case and it, uh, you can use it to get uh, anti-diagonal solutions of the reflection equation for the quantum sl2 r matrix uh, and this construction was already made in some kind of completion it was a basically a series and more recently uh, there's been a kind of a more uh, let's say uh, more or less ad hoc approach the more a comprehensive approach based on uh, the structure theory of so-called uh, quantized fixed-point subalgebras. So uh, you have UQG, which is a Hopf algebra, and Letzter in the late 90s, and, and shortly thereafter wrote a series of papers on how these uh, fixed-point subalgebras naturally uh, cuneiform to co-ideal subalgebras of uh, of the quantum group UQG. So not Hopf algebras themselves, but co-ideal subalgebras. And so there's a uh, well, there's basically uh, an interpretation of that, uh, which we'll come to in a minute, why that's natural anyway, but you have to be a bit more relaxed. You can't just allow for whole subalgebras, but you have to allow for something which is slightly uh, slightly more general, and these are the co-ideal subalgebras. But she, she, Lester, she uh, developed a very kind of comprehensive structure theory for these, for these subalgebras, uh, only in finite type, so G is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, and I'm using this uh, there's a series of, of results uh, that actually uh, outlines how to or show the existence of uh, universal solutions of, the, of this uh, special re particular reflection equation. Okay, and so uh, first of all, by Bao and Wang, there was a large family fixed point subalgebras of UQSLN that was studied, and they constructed uh, in a particular completion of, of, of quantum SLN solutions of this reflection equation. And they did this roughly by uh, generalizing Lustig's work on the R matrix. So it's not really the Drinfeld approach of the, of the quantum double of the universal R matrix they generalized, but the interpretation of a factor of the universal R matrix as an intertwiner of so-called bar involutions. And that's how they could uh, show that the particular inter similar intertwiner exists, which is a factor of the universal K matrix, the key factor of the universal K matrix. And then this was shortly thereafter generalized by the language and called to all these fixed points of algebras from Lester's scheme. Uh, so all of finite types still. 
And then with, with vidas Rigelskis, uh, we generalize this a little bit further to so-called pseudo-fixed points of algebras. Now, I don't have the really the time to define these precisely, but they're, they're further generalization of fixed point sub-algebras. And a nice thing here is that that leads to a conjectural classification of all invertible solutions of the constant reflection equation. So this is kind of promising uh, that you know, in recent years, there has been so much uh, kind of development in, in, in this, but there's still a, kind of a bridge to cross in order to get to the spectral reflection equation, right? So we have to kind of uh, go find a new uh, version of this universal reflection equation, because this one that's at the top of the screen here simply doesn't work to get uh, the desired parameter dependent reflection equation in, in uh, for matrices. So here's uh, kind of the second, second attempt. We simply have to uh, generalize things somewhat. And so we're going to introduce a twist by an algebra automorphism. So my A is still my quantum group, let's say my algebra of symmetries. Uh, I still have a universal R matrix R, I have a class of representations C, and I have these parameter dependent representations pi, B, Y. And suppose I have an algebra automorphism, and suppose I can construct a solution of this twisted universal reflection equation. So here, Every time after I've applied K, I'm getting a twist in Psi, sorry, a Psi twist on R, right? So here, after I've applied this K, I'm getting a, a twist on R given by Psi, and here, after I've applied K, I'm getting a twist on R, and again, apply K, and again, there's a new twist on R. And so uh, the notation here is simply that I'm applying Psi in the first leg of R or in the first and the second leg of R. Okay, and then you can check that the spectral reflection equation is now satisfied. If, and this is of course a big if, you can also choose this psi so that this inversion relation holds for the representations. And then if you assume this, it's very straightforward to check. Like before, like in the case for the R matrix, for instance, that you get an actual solution of the spectral reflection equation. Okay, that's just a straightforward check, applying the representation maps on the, on the universal relation. And so there's now two problems to solve rather than just one. <laughs> I have to find a solution of this universal reflection equation, and I have to choose psi such that this relation holds. So, but in a way, you can, just, you can say that I've split up the problem into more manageable chunks, rather than having one big problem that I couldn't solve before. Now, actually, as I've stated it, it's not possible to do this for all representations across the category C that I'm interested in, which will be the finite dimensional representation of the quantum loop algebra. Uh, so it will be true for certain representations, which will be nice, and we can you kind know, of look at those and the familiar ones, familiar, let's say, vector representations of quantum and affine SL2, they come under this more special case where you can actually deduce the, the proper, like the original reflection equation. So you have to do with a slightly weaker condition, which I'll tell you later. So a generalization of this inversion relation. Uh, but then what you will get out of it is that you'll get Chiretnik's generalized reflection equation out of it uh, in terms of these ribbons that we uh, looked at on Monday briefly. And so what you have to do is you simply have to uh, apply the representation maps. But now you have to take into account that there's a psi or even two psi is applied to this R matrix. And that gives you these three different R matrices. Uh, they will arise naturally in, in, the, in the representation. Okay, and then so this the equation you actually will solve. Using this for using this um, a universal approach, okay. And so here, I just remind you how the how the how the reflection equation can be translated into pictures. So that's the general approach, uh, and so uh, we have to kind of now make it work using a completions because quantum affine algebras, like any uh, quantum Katsumuri algebra, they're kind of they're infinite dimensional objects and. Uh, the, the solutions don't exist in the algebra themselves, which is well known anyway uh, for, let's say, R matrices in finite type. And secondly, we have to be really careful with the spectral parameter, how, it, how that arises. Uh, and I'll ah. come to that. Yeah. Do you have a study this second type of equations for finite case? Or UQG or UQSL2 without at, with the psi? Y yes. So. So the formalism I will uh, explain uh, will also apply to finite type. And so you can also look at this equation, this more general equation in finite type. And in fact, I, I was kind of uh, cheating here in some way. Uh, oh, sorry, if I go back to this slide, in this paper by Balaikovic and Kolb, and in fact, also in the paper after that, sometimes you do get some kind of twist. 
like this, but it won't be an algebra, not just an algebra automorphism, it will be a Hopf algebra automorphism, which actually preserves the R matrix. So this R psi psi will just be R here. And then what you will get in some cases is a solution of the transpose twisted reflection equation, constant transpose twisted reflection equation. And some, some people prefer to write the constant reflection equation with these twists. And that is already taken into account, but that cannot still account for this uh, parameter inversion. So it is basically rather than finding an alternative to, to this approach for finite type, we're generalizing it to something that also works for affine type, let's say. And so uh, I need to kind of give some more detail on the quantum affine algebras. Um, and so let's just first look again at, at our matrices. So we uh, we gave a little bit of a, a review in uh, yesterday, at the, towards the end of, of the of the lecture yesterday. So I'll just uh, I'll sketch some details. Now this whole the, the, the benefit of this whole theory uh, is ba basically based on this work, uh, let's say by Letster, which was generalized by Kolb to uh, all Katsumuri types, is that everything is very general. Uh, everything can be done in one go in some sense. There's fairly little case case work. There's hardly any computations. It's just general kind of arguments uh, using, let's say, uh, decompositions and projections in the algebra itself. And, and so it, I, I could do this talk without giving any examples, for instance, which would be probably very unpedagogical. So there will be a running example of quantum affine SL2 as well. But I'll first kind of set up the, the general picture. And then as we move through the, the development of the theory, I'll, I'll illustrate it with quantum affine SL2. Anyway, so in general, though, we have we can start with a simple Lie algebra, finite dimension simple Lie algebra. So you can write down the Chevalet Serre presentation. I don't specify it precisely, but it will be of this form with some generators. And you can then extend this to an affine Lie algebra via its loop algebra. So the loop algebra is just uh, this tensor product with already uh, something like a spectral parameter appearing. And then you extend it by a central extension and extension by derivations. And then you get to the affine Lie algebra. And both the affine Lie algebra and G itself are examples of Katsumuri algebras. And so a lot of the theory is actually valid for Katsumuri algebras in general and, and their quantizations. But we'll focus on the affine case anyway. And so this presentation for G hat extends the presentation for G. I just add one more uh, set of SL2 generators, E0, F0, H0, plus an extra D, which is this D here essentially, this, this derivation. Okay. Uh, and so again, there's similar relations. I don't specify them in, in, this, in this general setting here, but they are well known. And so you can Q-deform not G itself on G hat, but you can Q-deform the universal enveloping algebra. And then the universal enveloping algebra, by definition, uh, or by, canon by canonical construction, is a co-commutative uh, Hopf algebra. Uh, and so if you want to Q-deform it, you lose the co-commutativity. Uh, but you get something which is in some sense nicer in, in return, you get an, uh, an R matrix, you get a quasi triangular structure. Uh, so in, a, in effect, you can say you get a non-trivial solution to a Braid equation. Uh, the, the UG setting will give you a trivial solution. So you get something non-trivial in this construction. Of course, the construction is not completely uh, uh, non-trivial in, in, in essence so to, to get to this point uh, requires more uh, further work, which, which has, was, was started in the 80s. Uh, but uh, it's a well-known theory at this point for, for the R matrices. And so uh, to be clear, uh, as was uh, emphasized yesterday, we, should, we need to choose Q non-zero and not a root of unity. You can define the, the, the algebra UQG has for root of unity as well, but then very soon the representation theory becomes more complicated in that case. So we just assume it from the start that it's not a root of unity. And so you get a very similar presentation. So you have, again, uh, SL2 triples, although now it's quantum SL2. Uh, and so this H gets replaced by an invertible element in its inverse, but roughly the E and the F survive in some sense. And so you can roughly think of them as the same as you had in the universal enveloping algebra. So again, you have N plus one of these triples or quadruples, I guess, and you have a new uh, invertible generator roughly corresponding to D or rather Q to the D, and you have Q deformations of the relations. I'm not going to give you the precise details, but just as a general uh, idea, it's, it's, it's sufficient here to, to have this picture. Okay, so let's look at the affine SL2 and quantum affine SL2, just to make it a little bit more concrete. And this, these are already fairly complicated relations, so I don't want to give them in full generality, but it gives you, gives you the idea anyway for the, for the general picture. So you have uh, two SL2 triples uh, labeled with zero and one, and you have this extra 
grading element D, derivation D. Okay, and so here you have the SL2 relations for each triple, and then you have the cross relations, and then you have the relations for D. So D kind of measures, uh, let's say, some, some kind of uh, degree of the other, the other generators. Okay, and so uh, that's just a standard uh, presentation for uh, the Katsumuri algebra of an SL2. And a Q deformation then looks like this, at least in, let's say, one particular convention. Uh, and so in some sense, uh, rather than working with the full carton from here, you have to work with a lattice that is contained in the carton. And here I've chosen the lattice small. So this is also known as the adjoint form of, of the quant quantized universal enveloping algebra. You can in introduce kind of, uh, let's say, square roots or particular roots of these generators, Ki, and then you have used, let's say, the weight lattice to, to uh, guide your, uh, to, to, kind of to define your uh, quantum uh, carton subalgebra. So here I've used the root lattice. And so the, the relations uh, are two deformations of these, of these relations, which can be made precise. Uh, this is a precise statement, uh, which I won't go into here, but basically, roughly, you can say that these, these KIs are basically Q to the power HI in the appropriate sense. And at least when you talk about representations, that, well, that's how they will act. Okay, and so, and also D is Q to the little d. And the Hopf algebra structure, uh, is as follows. So I'm just saying it here to make to, to tell you what convention I'm using because there's different conventions. So these are always group-like, and for EI and FI, I'm using this. These they are, these are skew primitive elements, so they're group-like elements appear uh, to destroy the co-commutativity, basically. Okay, that's uh, just to give a bit of detail, so we, or we can make precise statements. But the, the, the same level of details could be provided in general. And so we can talk about the quasi-triangular structure briefly. Uh, so the R matrix, the universal R matrix. So it's good to first identify two subalgebras, which are quantum analogs of the upper and lower nilpotent subalgebras. Uh, and so uh, these are simply the generators E all together, the generators F all together, and what they generate. And so that that allows us to define this category O that we talked about yesterday. And so you can uh, kind of say it in one sentence as type one weight modules with finite dimensional weight spaces such that this UQN hat plus acts locally finitely. So that means this statement here. And so somehow uh, these are uh, sort of the, the irreducible elements, I should say, of this category are highest weight modules. But the weight lattice you use for this is the full affine weight lattice, including, uh, including let's say, alpha zero. And so uh, in for finite dimensional representations, uh, which are not in this category O, E zero will act like an F. So here, all the E's act in the same direction. So you get this kind of uh, weight, uh, weight modules that kind of get wider as you go down, down, the, down, down the module. And, and so these are infinite dimensional modules. There's a subcategory, uh, O int, which will be important later on, where in addition to these conditions, also each E, I, and F, I act locally no multiple. Okay. If you do this construction for finite type quantum groups, what you'll get for all int are precisely their finite dimensional representations, type one finite dimensional representations. But for, for the non-finite setting, including the affine setting, you still have infinite dimensional representations here. So both categories are large enough in the sense that they separate points. So you can use the category uh, to distinguish the action of each element, uh, each pair of elements from the quantum group. And hence, uh, I can embed the quantum group in terms of these completions like this. And so completions were defined yesterday in terms of all uh, collections of linear maps, which commute with the action, which commute with all intertwiners. Okay, and then the, this R matrix can be construction, constructed in the tensor, in the completion of the tensor product with respect to this category O. And, and this is actually a statement that's true for all, uh, cut, all quantized Katsumuri algebras. Uh, and so uh, let's say using quantum double construction or let's say Lustig's approach using bar uh, involution intertwiners. Uh, with our choice of co-products, uh, this R matrix essentially lies in a completion of this. So first, let's say the Fs and then the Es. There's also a Cartan factor, uh, which kind of, uh, you have to take into account as well, which plays an important role, but let's say the, 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 the series part of, of the universal R matrix, which kind of does, does the most work in some sense, lies in the completion of, of of this tensor product in, 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 this, in these conventions. So what about finite dimensional representations then? So they are actually representations of a slightly different algebra. So you can take uh, the loop algebra again that we 
started with a few slides ago, you can look at it's a universal developing algebra and deform that you deform that directly and you get a uh, different different looking algebra, uh, also known as Drinfeld's new presentation or the quantum loop presentation uh, of the quantum affin algebra. But it's of a, not not of the whole quantum affin algebra as I just defined it. So, but there is an isomorphism. So in full generality, it was proved by Beck in 1994 that this quantum loop algebra, which I didn't explicitly define in terms of another uh, this, this Drinfeld's new presentation, is isomorphic to a quotient of a subalgebra of the of the quantum group due to Drinfeld Jimbo. Okay, so you ignore this generator capital D, and you mod out by uh, this by the central element essentially. So the C should act as zero. So Q to the C, which is a particular well-defined element expressed in terms of these KIs, is set to one. And then you get something that's isomorphic to the loop algebra, the quantum loop algebra. And so our class of modules, the C that I started with on my very first slide, uh, will be finite dimensional type one quantum loop algebra modules. Okay, and so the, the representation theory for C, you actually naturally de develop using this representation, this presentations, the presentation here, which I didn't specify. But I only actually, as it happens, need one result from this. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the great benefit somehow is that you can still work with the Chevalet Serre presentation. You can use the e and, EI and FI generators somehow. And you just need a little bit of information about irreducible modules. And the information we will need for the universal K matrix is the following theorem, which is a very simple theorem to state. And it is actually also not so difficult to prove using uh, Drinfeld's new presentation, using the loop presentation of the quantum F algebra. And, and uh, so it, it was kind of surprising that it wasn't actually proved until uh, quite recently. So Chari and Greenstein had a similar result in 2005, and Hernandez and Jimpo were very kind of courteous to say, actually, it already, it already follows from the result from Chari and Greenstein, but here we prove it ex more explicitly, let's say we state it more explicitly, and it's a fairly short proof. And it's a very, actually, in a way, surprising statement that any irreducible finite dimensional representation of UQLG, so any irreducible representation in our class C, they are already irreducible as modules of this subalgebra, of the uh, nilpotent subalgebra. So um, this is actually an analogous statement that's not true in finite type, because if you just act with, let's say, either E's or F's on particular uh, highest weight factors, you will not get the whole module. But uh, here, actually, for quantum affine, uh, for quantum loop algebra representation, it is true. And so, uh, what they actually prove, Hernandez uh, and Jimbo, is the same, the analogous statement for the Borel algebra, the quantum Borel algebra. But you can kind of tweak their arguments very slightly, and it actually works with the nilpotent subalgebra. We will uh, use this later on uh, when we're talking about uh, K matrices. And that's actually the only. Uh, let's say, uh, representation theoretic statement about this category C that we will need to, to really make the argument work. So we can forget about this Drinfeld's loop presentation in some sense and just work with this theorem later on and work with the Chevalier-Serre presentation. And then to make it uh, to make the argument uh, watertight, even for the R matrix already, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to somehow explain how this universal object, which is defined for category O, acts on this different category C the finite dimensional representations we're interested in. And so first of all, uh, the spectral parameter Z needs to be treated as a formal parameter. And once we obtain uh, particularly nice matrices at the very end of, the, of, the, of, this, of this program due to Drinfeld, then you can specialize it to complex numbers. And so you look at formal Laurent series. Formal Laurent series are like formal power series, except that you are allowed to start at the negative power of, of Z. Okay, so these coefficients are non-zero, for only finitely many negative. So they only have one tail, they go, they're allowed to go to infinity, but they're not allowed to go to minus infinity. And we have some you know, co convenient notation. Whenever I tensor with the formal Laurent series, with the field of formal Laurent series, I will just write it with these brackets, parentheses, double parentheses Z after the vector space. So I will do that for uh, the quantum group and also for modules of the quantum. And then the next thing you need to do is introduce a very simple map, a sort of so-called shift automorphism of the quantum uh, the quantum affine algebra, but of this quantum affine algebra where the field of scalars has been extended like this with, with these formal Laurent series. So first of all, you simply choose a grading. So that's simply a specification of some non-negative integers. They're not, they're not all allowed to be zero. 
so for instance, you can use homogeneous grading where you set a zero equal to one and the rest to zero. And then you define this automorphism, which is a very simple map. It simply introduces certain powers of Z and the EIs get positive or at least non-negative powers. And the FIs get non-positive powers and the other generators, they don't get any power. So this, this measures some kind of uh, grading of these elements. And the observation that Rinthal could make was that if you apply this to the R matrix in one leg like this, then this becomes a power series. And so it, it becomes a generated function, if you like. And the coefficients of this power series still are not elements of the quantum loop algebra, but they have a well-defined action on, the, on modules, on finite dimensional modules of the quantum loop algebra. So the, the coefficients of this are in the completion of the quantum loop algebra with respect to this fin class of finite dimensional representations. Okay, so that's the basic idea of why this works. And so the same thing will, have, will be true for the K-matrix. And so now we can kind of state uh, Drinfeld's result and then we'll compare it to what Jimbo did uh, previously, which is closely related. Uh, and so if I take uh, any UQLG module with representation of pi V, I can turn this into a module for the uh, for the algebra with the field of scalars extended to the to this formal Laurent series by just first applying the shift map. Okay, and so you get parameter dependent representations that way, but the parameter is really a formal parameter at this point. And so I'm getting uh, formal, uh, sorry, I'm getting matrix valued formal series out of this. Okay, and then the statement uh, is as follows. So if you look at the universal R matrix and you apply uh, such a tensor product of uh, representation with one of them grading shifted, then you get some kind of uh, formal uh, series, which will be actually a well-defined element. Despite the, the, you know, the series nature of R, you get a well-defined element or acting on the tensor product, generating function of matrices, let's say, and satisfying very straightforward linear intertwining equation. Uh, this comes directly from the uh, corresponding equation for the universal R matrix, the first axiom of the universal R matrix, let's say. And it also satisfies the spectral Young Baxter equation as a consequence of the universal Young Baxter equation. And then the second part of the statement will have a similar second part for the, for the K matrices. If additionally V and W are reducible, then you can say something about the tensor product. And the upshot is that there is actually a rational uh, there's, a, there's a formal object with a rational dependence on Z uh, acting on uh, on, tensor, on, on this tensor product V tensor W. And so you call it a trigonometric R matrix. A trigonometric in the sense that it has a dependence on the logarithm of Z. And so you actually get this factorization. So the whole series business disappears into the scalar and you actually work with a, a, a matrix which depends rationally on this formal parameter Z. Uh, this, of course, then this, uh, this kind of simpler matrix still satisfies the Young-Baxter equation and the intertwining equation as well. And you can actually get this unitarity equation as well from the same argument by just adjusting this by an irrational scalar. Okay, so that's, that's nice. This was done by Grunfeld. And so uh, let's do one example briefly, the canonical example. So uh, if I take the two-dimensional representation of the quantum loop algebra, so I'm, I'm just writing, giving you the formula for the constant representation, the, the Z-independent representation, which is, looks like this. So it's just the representation of quantum SL2 and then kind of uh, the opposite representation uh, for the zero node. So here E0 acts like F1 and F0 as E1. Uh, if you do that, you can apply, the, you can make this, a, a, into, you turn it into a grading shifted representation and you get the Z-dependent representation. And depending on your choice of grading, it will look slightly differently. But for our choice, with S0 equal to one and S1 equal to zero, the homogeneous grading, the, the zero, E0 and F0 get a particular power of Z appearing here. So Z here and Z equals here. If you then uh, follow this approach, you can solve this intertwining equation and you get this, uh, the matrix, the R matrix we already saw earlier, the well-known six vertex R matrix, particular form depending on, because we've chosen this grading. So a non-symmetric form. So, uh, so as I've defined it, this is still uh, has a formal dependence on Z, but it's clearly rational. So what I can now do is specialize that to, uh, let's say, uh, complex numbers, uh, which are not equal to Q squared. And I have a, I have a function with a particular open domain. And so, 
uh, I can think of it as a function, uh, which is pleasant. And uh, so uh, out of this, in the end, you actually get functions, matrix value functions. Can I just um, ask a question? Yeah. So how was Z not being equal to Q squared built into the previous theorem? Uh, it, it, it wasn't because the, there Z was a formal parameter. So Z wasn't equal to anything. But once you have a formal parameter uh, and, and the expression, let's say, depends polynomially or rationally on something, then you can specialize. If it's polynomial, you can specialize it to anything in your, in your uh, field over which the coefficients are defined. And here, because it's a rational function, it's a quotient of polynomials, so I only have to worry about the denominator. And here, I, in this case, it's only Q squared, uh, which is the awkward point. But because it's a, if, it's a formal, uh, if it's a formal object, and I, I don't, you know, Z isn't equal to Q squared. It cannot be equal to Q squared. You just have this uh, power series. You think of this as some kind of um, uh, geometric, geometric series. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so it's a generating function, right? So you, have, uh, you, you only have coefficients. That's all you have, really, and you just put them together in a generating function. But for these particular generating functions uh, that I can write uh, using the geometric series like this, then I can think of them as functions as well. There's some analytical, analytical, continu analytical continuation going on actually, yeah. but uh, they are defined on a circle of convergence, but you can actually extend them to an open set, uh, just basically the whole complex plane minus some, po minus some points. And so that's the first thing. And the second comment is that, well, uh, actually, of course, many of these R matrices were already known. And in fact, a year before Dunfeld's paper, Jimbo uh, computed a whole uh, class of them. Uh, and actually also prove they satisfy the young Baxter equation uh, quite rigorously. Uh, and so in practice, to actually find the um, R matrix in your representation specifically, you would, you, you would follow Jimbo's approach. You would follow, uh, you would compute, uh, so you would use the uh, intertwining equation in the representation to find uh, this linear relation to find the, the trigonometric R matrix. But then the benefit of the universal approach is it guarantees that it has a solution a rational solution, and then for all irreducibles in your in your class of representations, that this solution satisfies the Young-Baxter equation without any further checks. And now for k-matrices, there's a similar uh, we can do a similar approach now. So first of all, I have to choose I have to identify a particular type of subalgebra of my quantum group, which will play the role of the algebra of uh, symmetries that are preserved are compatible with the with the inclusion of the boundary. So there's diff different possible boundary conditions you could imagine that you could impose that will preserve some symmetries and and these different choices correspond to different uh, subalgebras and uh, and so uh, what is a very fruitful approach is to uh, look at uh, q deformations of certain fixed point subalgebras so for finite type let's start at this and uh, for general katsmuri the algebras and their quantization scope extended it uh, but there was one assumption you had to make uh, to do this is automorph you have to look, fix look at fixed point subalgebras of an automorphism of the second kind. And an automorphism of the second kind is like, it's not the identity. It's it, identity uh, keeps the two nilpotent subalgebras in their place. You have to do, you have to choose an um, automorphism which almost completely swaps them. It swaps them up to a finite dimensional exception. And so that's stated here. So it's an involution and the intersection of the nilpotent subalgebra with its image under theta is finite dimensional. So most elements of, uh, so intuitively, most elements of this nilpotent subalgebra go to n minus, well, n, n hat minus, to so the other nilpotent subalgebra. And so this is a little bit actually what you expect when you want this inversion of spectral parameter. Because what we just saw, the E's get associated with a positive power of Z and the F with a negative power, the F's with a negative power of Z. And so somehow, if you want to uh, relate this parameter inversion in terms of a uh, algebra automorphism, it should be of the second kind. So this theta, we will use it to define the map psi later on, this twist map psi that we need in order to make sense of this uh, universal approach. But anyway, for now, we simply define the fixed point subalgebra like this, just the points that are points in the Lie algebra are fixed by theta. And then uh, Kolb outlined uh, a general theory of Q deformations as a right for the subalgebra. So there is a subalgebra of this affine quantum group, uh, which is a right co-ideal. That means uh, if I think of this as the algebra of bulk symmetries and the algebra B theta as the algebra of boundary symmetries, then I want to have some kind of idea of fusion where I can take any um, 
representation of the boundary algebra and combine it with a bulk algebra uh, representation to get a new representation of the boundary algebra. And so for this, you need some kind of co-ideal condition like this. And so for U UQG is a is a bi-algebra, so UQG just it tends it's it, the tool coprol it maps it to a tensor part of UQG with UQG. But for this boundary algebra, you have this kind of asymmetry. The the but in this case the bulk is on the right, and so I will get a solution to the left reflection equation out of this. And the other condition uh, of this, but yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, have you also the unicity of the deformations in this case, like for the UQG? Have I, have I done what for the? Sorry, I didn't hear for the, the, for the quantum group, you have the unicity of the deformations when you give the small delta. Ah, yeah. Do you have the same thing here? Uh, so, uh, Kolb proves in this in this paper that this is in some sense unique. It's the namely the the max is defined. To, you can define it to be the the largest possible co-ideal subalgebra with with which Q deforms the fixed the universal and developing algebra of the fixed point subalgebra. That is the that is in that sense it's, it is unique uniquely defined. Uh, I don't know if that's what you have in mind, but that's that's how it is yes. set up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so explicitly, uh, it's actually defined explicitly in terms of particular generators, and the interesting generators are of this form, uh, Fi plus some element of UQM plus hat corrected by this carton to make to make this co-ideal property work, and this element of UQM plus. It could be EI, let's say. That's the kind of the simplest case. Uh, and it, it, it reflects the fact that we have this second kind uh, condition. So somehow FIs are combined with EIs. Okay. And so this theory contains uh, many uh, already known cases for in the affine setting. It also is actually valid in the general symmetrizable Katsumuri setting. So it, it actually uh, extends beyond affine type. So also, for instance, uh, twisted affine type is included. But anyway, even for untwisted affine type, it, it kind of uh, contains some nice special cases which were already studied before this, so-called uh, generalized Q-Onzaga algebras, uh, which were already studied in many settings with, with many uh, applications in mind. Uh, there are special cases of this. And also so-called, uh, let's say, quantum affine lifts of fixed point subalgebras of SLN, also called Q-twisted Yangians, or sorry, twisted q Yangians, as you'd say, that small labs uh, terminology, uh, they were also uh, part of this more general definition. And so the example we can look at um, for uh, to kind of to, to follow throughout the, the rest of the talk is the q onzaga algebra embedded in quantum affine SL2. And so what you do is you take uh, SL2, you take its loop algebra, its, its affinization, and you look at the involution which simply swaps E's and F's and sends H's to minus H's. Okay, and so this is an example where all, uh, this is certainly of the second kind where all E's become F's and, and vice versa. So it's kind of the opposite of the identity map in some sense. And so you can then check that this is the fixed points of algebra generated by these two kind of composite elements and the Q deformation simply of this form. So I'm actually allowed to introduce an extra um, Cartan term, let's say, and if Q goes to one, it disappears. Yeah, it's just a convenient way of writing it here. Um, okay, so there's a so there's two generators. It's a one of the kind of more, more straightforward cases, but it's a very interesting one nevertheless. And there's two free parameters that you can get in this uh, algebra. There's actually more. There's two more that you can put in front of the EI, let's say, but they can be uh, kind of gauged away using Hopf algebra automorphism. So I'm not considering them here. So I just have these two free parameters. Okay, then this is the first main result. It's from the earlier paper for category O. And so uh, I'm, I'm giving some detail, not all detail, but basically there exists an algebra automorphism psi of the quantum affine algebra, and there exists an invertible element K, uh, which is the universal K matrix. Uh, it, it acts, uh, has a well-defined action on interval modules of category O. So it's kind of slightly smaller subcategory, and it satisfies this psi modified interfining equation. And this uh, universal reflection equation with, with the size appearing there as a twist. And so this builds on the work that I've already cited for finite type. So really, uh, in a way, uh, this statement here, if you if you read really carefully, it is kind of there already in the work by Balakovich and Kolb for general Katsmuri algebras. Um, and but they don't call this K0 the universal K matrix because they really wanted the matrix where this psi was the identity, or at most 
uh, hopeful algebra automorphism. And so you can't do that for affine type is, is, uh, is the received wisdom. But for affine type, you have to work with something of the second kind. And so this psi has to be of the second kind. And so they, they couldn't extend their work to, to the affine case in full general, in, in, uh, for, uh, in terms of this reflection equation here. And so this psi zero, how does it arise? Where does it come from? It's a particular Q deformation of theta, the map that we uh, use to define the coidal subalgebra and the fixed point subalgebra. Okay, and then you can use this intertwining relation to define K0 uniquely. Again, using uh, so how a boundary version of Lustig's approach to the R matrix. Uh, so this K0 is not explicitly constructed, it's just shown to exist in the completion. Then uh, you can modify this by some kind of gauging group. You can look at the group of all invertible elements of your uh, of your completion. And this is why we want to work with O into you, because then you have more elements to play with. And you can simply take your seed solution, psi zero, k zero, and then you can conjugate by such an invertible element uh, to modify psi and left multiply to modify k. And that gives you more solutions with a different psi, more solutions of the reflection equation with a different psi. And the idea is you can keep, uh, you can modify this in such a way such that psi will eventually work for these uh, finite dimensional representations and give you parameter inversion. And this is almost, uh, almost true in some sense. That comes on the next slide. But basically, you have some freedom, some wiggle room to modify uh, the setup here and get different size. So this universal reflection equation is not an axiom. It actually comes from a co-product formula, which I don't specify here, and uh, the usual relation for the R matrix. So this result is valid for the general uh, symmetrizable Katz-Moody setting. And so uh, for the affine case that we're interested in, uh, so I can follow Drinfeld setup here, uh, and so I have a grading. And I can actually choose the twist in a compatible way with the grading, such that I have this promising looking relation. So I can pull the twist through the grading and I invert it. And this is because psi is, is of the second kind. Psi was built from theta, and theta was of the second kind. And all I've done is conjugate, I've composed a theta with conjugation by some element, which will mean it, the result is still of the second kind. So it swaps E's and F's. Okay. Then I can look at a particular uh, UQG hat module, V, and I can twist it with Psi. That means I simply first apply Psi and then I apply the representation map. Okay, and so I will call that the module V Psi. And then uh, I can take uh, any module V, whether it's twisted by Psi or not, and I can define my grading shifted representation as, uh, as we saw already for the R matrix. And now we obtain the key relation that, that connects psi and uh, the, the grading shifted representation. And so rather than just saying, okay, this psi will cause the parameter to invert, that's true, but it will also, there will still be a residual uh, modification of the module structure on the constant representation. That's kind of the price you have to pay for this. And in principle, you cannot get rid of this piece. You cannot get rid of this psi here. And, this piece, right? all the and then the theorem uh, is as follows. You have a well-defined formal Laurent series coming out of this universal approach by simply applying the representation map from the universal K matrix for category O modules. And it satisfies uh, two relations, by twisted boundary intertwining equation. So this is now an equation in, in, in mat for matrices uh, and a reflection equation that, that we're after. So this is basically an example of Chiretnik's generalized reflection equation in terms of these ribbons, okay? So this is this is for formal series. If you want, um, if you want actual uh, trigonometric matrices, so rational functions in this multiplicative parameter z. Well, if uh, the UQG hat module v is irreducible by the result of uh, Hernandez and Jimbo, we know it's actually irreducible as of the subalgebra of the, let's say, the lower nilpotent subalgebra, and I can then kind of go sideways by. Uh, the action of Z somehow and go to these, uh, go to the, such a coidal subalgebra, which is basically generated by Fi plus something in UQN plus. And there is basically the, um, the grading shift will allow you to separate these two uh, components and that will allow you to prove irreducibility with respect to this coidal subalgebra, provided you take uh, this uh, extension of scalars in terms of formal low series for both the module and the algebra, the theta. Uh, and so you can apply Schur's lemma essentially and deduce that the solution space of this intertwining equation is one dimension. Now, if I go back here, this here, because of the dependence of the spectral parameter, 
is a is a as an equation in the unknown kv y it's a rational as a rational dependence on z so i can argue there is a solution given by the universal k matrix that's this statement here but because it has a rational dependence on z that means there exists a solution actually in the smaller field of uh, rational expressions which is contained in this field of long series this is just a linear algebra state and so if then the solution space is one-dimensional, they must coincide up to a scalar. And that's the statement here that we also had for our matrices. Okay, and then this rational function of Z to satisfy, still satisfies the twisted reflection equation. And you have a unitarity statement with some additional natural condition. If somehow applying Psi twice gets you back to the original module V, then you can sensibly talk about the unitarity condition. And indeed, that, in that case, it holds up to some scalar modification. Okay, and so uh, if you now actually want to find the trigonometric solution of the reflection equation for some irreducible module, you just solve the linear system directly. And again, the, the power of the universal approach tells you that the solution will exist and it will automatically satisfy the reflection equation. And that's no longer necessary to check separately. And you don't have to worry about uh, irreducibility either. That's all covered in this statement due to this result by Hernandez and Jimbo, essentially. If you really want the original reflection equation that Chiretnik looked at and, and asked it's Kian in the 80s without the specific twist psi, well, there, there we have a condition, which is difficult to state, but there is a, basically a condition that tells you some kind of combinatorial constraint on theta. If that's satisfied, and V is also irreducible as a module of the finite type quantum group, then you can choose psi in that way, such that this, this twist can disappear, and then you obtain the original reflection equation. And so this is true in the case of the q on Zaga algebra and the two-dimensional representation. So in that case, so we already looked at. So we know that we know the algebra, we know the sub-algebra, we have a representation on, on two-dimensional space. Uh, this result applies top of the screen. And so we can choose psi such that this holds. And in other words, we get a solution of the original reflection equation. And we recover a solution, which is known as the most general solution uh, of the of the reflection equation for. Uh, quantum affinance L2 in two-dimensional representation, which was found in the 90s. Okay, and so you can recover this, but of course you could do this for any uh, irreducible representation for any quantum affine algebra. So there's some generalizations uh, and classifications. Let me maybe stress here one or two things. Um, results that we actually have here are, are valid for so-called pseudo fixed points of algebras, which is a generalization of fixed points of algebras. And then uh, you can state the conjecture that each symmetrizable invertible trigonometric k-matrix originates from such a universal, uh, valid, uh, universal approach starting from some quantized pseudo fixed points of algebra. The conjecture is based simply on the fact that I've looked at lots of uh, solutions of the reflection equation in modules uh, as matrices, and I could always relate them as long as they were symmetrizable and invertible uh, as intertwiners of some quantum pseudo fixed points of algebra. There are also triangular solutions which are not covered by this framework. And so in the quantum FNL2 case, uh, Pascal and Samuel have a paper on this, uh, actually on some other coordinate subalgebra as well, but that's one of them, the triangular coordinate subalgebra. Suboy has a, a universal K-matrix formalism for that one, uh, which is interesting to compare with this formalism. But in general, uh, this is a kind of a wide open field. These coordinate subalgebras are not well known. They just have this, uh, some basic results about matrices and this quantum FN SL2 case studied in more detail. Okay, hey, I'm running out of time. So this is the last slide. So let me just say there are uh, further kind of more advanced open problems, let's say, where you want to apply it to some more kind of advanced representation theory constructions or integrability constructions. So I'll just list this, leave this here, this list here on the screen uh, if you want to ask questions about it. Uh, but let me say for now, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. Uh, are there more questions? I think I miss a point. Uh, what is the connection between the theta, which define your algebra, mm -hmm. and the psi, which is yes. in the reflection equations? Yes, good, good question. I went over it very quickly, so I'll go over it more slowly because I think it was in, well, maybe got lost in the detail here. So you first solve this system for the choice where psi is actually a Q deformation of theta, a well-defined Q deformation of theta that I could write down explicitly uh, if, if you wanted me to. And so that's where the theta appears. And then I can say, I can uh, modify this by, this by this gauging action with invertible elements. 
And so then I can turn uh, this quantum deformed theta to other types of uh, automorphisms with second kind. And, and so there's a lot of open choice, lots of choice there. And then in this result, we say that you can do this such that the resulting psi relates to parameter inversion in this way. And that will give you the psi twisted reflection equation with, uh, uh, that we started with. Uh, uh, okay, but so you, you have an existence uh, theorem mm -hmm. for, for K, and but you say you don't actually need, need to take the explicit formula because you have the delius Mackay type approach. I mean, but yep. can you ever make it constructive? So, so can you reconstruct the known solutions out of mm -hmm. your, uh, your K? One, one can hope that, that this is possible, and it is possible for R matrices. So this is the, uh, the second point here. For R matrices, Groschen and Tolstoy have an infinite product, uh, and that's not the most practical way to get to uh, these kind of trigonometric R matrices, but it's possible in some kind of easy cases to do it explicitly that way. Uh, and so it'd be nice to find something similar for, for the K matrix, even in a particular example. Um, the result by um, uh, Tsuboy uh, here at the bottom is somewhat in this direction. It's quite explicit, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's tricky to deal with these uh, these things uh, in, in more general terms. Uh, so, if for finite type, it's much easier where you can have a finite product of let's say quantum SL two R matrices, and the same is true for K matrices. But for this for the affine setting, it's a, as far as I know, it's a big open problem. But with the universal R matrix, there's a kind of understood route in how to construct this in terms of quantum doubles and things. So you can yes. get the inf infinite product form. But is there any similar route that might give you optimism? So you can the the Horoshkin Tolstoy construction uh, uh, re relies on some kind of uh, ordering of a particular uh, root system, which is just the affine root system. Uh, that's kind of the key data that you need to guide to guide you when you're constructing this infinite product. And so we can, we can at least tentatively say that for the K matrix, there should be a particular ordering of this associated restricted root system. So the map theta, the evolution theta of the Lie algebra comes with a restricted root system, which are basically the fixed points of the root system under minus theta, which is also an evolution on the root system. Uh, and so that's the restricted root system. And that should uh, be the first step, I guess, in, in, this, uh, in this approach. Uh, there's not really a quantum double construction uh, for the K matrix uh, with as much detail as it is for the R matrix, but there is work by Kolb and Yakimov recently on a, a sort of uh, quantum double construction for, for universal K matrix. It doesn't quite give you an element K in a completion, but more like something like a map, uh, which it should be conjugation by K. So it's not quite the same level of detail, but it is a promising uh, direction as well. Pascal? Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I about. Uh, so, for instance, if you consider the Tolst uh, tolstoy koloshkin paper, where they construct the universal R matrix in terms of root vectors, what you just yep. uh, mentioned before, uh, the strategy there, I, um, do you have a vision of how to apply it for the case of the universal K matrix? Because the for instance, let's consider the kion sager uh, case. Mm -hmm. Okay, the root vectors are known. Mm -hmm. uh, Lustig automorphism is known. So do you see what would be the recipe to apply? Not, not in much more detail than I just outlined uh, by referring to the restricted root system, which I think in this case would just be the root system itself. And so somehow this is a tricky, most difficult case because the restricted root system is as big as it can. Uh, and so uh, it would be nice to, 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 to attack this, but I don't have any further, <laughs> further insights. Honestly, I, I, I don't know uh, straight away what, what to, what to, how to approach this. It's a really tricky problem to, to work with these infinite products, but uh, somebody should do this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Could you just imagine it's a folding, it's a dressing for the universal R matrix? So such like R matrix multiplied by the universal R matrix multiplied by phi R matrix, and it give you the universal K matrix. Ah, so uh, in a way that is true. So what I'm what I talked about here is a one-legged K matrix. So this K matrix lives in the in the in a completion of the quantum group. You, you can sandwich this with between two R matrices, which is 
construction already due to scanning already from the 80s. And then you get a K matrix with two legs, and it also and you can also have boundary, uh, let's say, assign representations to the boundary. And so you have this, that, that principle is, is already quite well known. And in fact, there's some results in finite type, at least, on, uh, on how to write this down precisely in terms of completions of this tensor product of boundary tensor bulk algebra. Uh, for, the, for affine type, it should also be, I expect it will be, uh, can be done similarly. We should have had time to write down precisely, but we should recover existing constructions due to scan and, uh, and pe people after him. Yeah. So there's also, uh, I think, uh, work uh, around 2005 uh, due to um, Mudrov and Coolish and Donin, I think, where they look at like squared R matrices as, a, as solutions of the reflection equation. And, and uh, they have a kind of a nice axiomatic formalism for this. I think it is really only for finite type, if I read it carefully. But it's the, the same principle appears here. So somehow you can, you can think of it as a squared R matrix, but really it's, a, it's really a conjugation of a simpler K matrix by two R matrices, or conjugation or sandwiching of a simpler K matrix by two R matrices. And the simpler K matrix can be the identity, and then you have a squared R matrix. <laughs> can I? Okay. And do you have, you, could you imagine something like the FRT paper saying mm -hmm. the universal, uh, the reflection equation define no the algebra? So there, there are some papers on this, uh, didn't cite them probably, although, for instance, uh, the papers by Molev, Fragusi, and Sorba here, they are, and also Chen, Guai, and Na, they follow this approach. Uh, and so um, they construct from explicit solutions of the reflection equation, particular co-module algebras, which, which you can embed into quantum affine, affine quantum groups as, as coil sub-algebras, and, and then Kolb observed, actually, they're covered by this more general formalism. They're kind of a special case. But you can certainly uh, do this potentially in, in a more, more general setting. So these were kind of particular examples for SLN. Uh, I, I think that will be uh, kind of always to some degree some hard casework because you have to start with a particular solution of the reflection equation. Uh, and it's a good question. And uh, I'm sure there are more papers for other special cases, which I'm not aware of. But here I was, we were trying to go in the opposite direction. So starting from the algebra of symmetries, get the get the explicit solutions or get the program for the explicit solution. But it should be compatible with an opposite program. Yeah, but at, at the end of the day, maybe just take a representation of the universal K matrix in one leg and the other one you get free and you get the, rep the representations or realizations for your algebra. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Nicola? Yeah. Uh, I, I, have a <laughs> I have a comment about that. And, uh... <laughs> A suggestion. So next week there will be a talk of uh, uh, Guillaume Lemart about uh, this. So mm -hmm. in that case, the uh, the, the uh, axiom of universal K matrix are extended to the two legs case. Ah, yes. Okay. And then you evaluate on the first leg, and then you get uh, K operators. Mm -hmm. And these K operators, the entries are in generating functions of the element of uh, Kion Sager. Ah, nice. Actually, alternative mm. central extension of Kion Sager. So it's a comodule algebra. So it, uh, details will be good. It's just a comment about this. Uh, okay. I'll look out for it. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much, uh, Bart, for you know, yeah. your whole series of lectures, which were very, thank you for uh, listening. very good, and we enjoyed them. Thank, thanks very much. Bart. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you.